Tonight we'll be in the 25th chapter of Genesis. This is our 38th lesson in this book. And we're going to cover some closing things that took place in Abraham's life and in his death and how it was stated, how he lived a long and a full life. We'd be pointing out, of course, some principles that are made known here, some introductions to God and the way, the proper way to view death, proper way to view life. And he's illustrating this in, in Abraham, showing us what faith, what faith does, how faith reacts, and how a person is being led by God lives, and all that's made known in Abraham's life. The first 11 verses of Genesis 25. Then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was Keturah. And she bare him Zimran, and Jokshan, and Medan, and Midian, and Ishbek, and Shua. And Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan. And the sons of Dedan were Asherim, and Letushim, and Liamim. And the sons of Midian, Ephah, and Epher, and Hanak, and Abida, and Eldea. All these were the children of Keturah. And Abraham gave all that he had unto Isaac. But unto the sons of the concubines which Abraham had, Abraham gave gifts and sent them away from Isaac his son while he lived eastward into the east country. These are the days of the years of Abraham's life, which he lived a hundred, threescore, and fifteen years. Then Abraham gave up the ghost and died in a good old age, an old man and full of years, and was gathered unto his people. And his sons Isaac and Ishmael buried him in the cave of Machpelah, in the field of Ephron, the son of Zoar, the Hittite, which is before Mamre, the field which Abraham purchased of the sons of Heth. There was Abraham buried, and Sarah his wife. And it came to pass, after the death of Abraham, that God blessed his son Isaac. And Isaac dwelt by the well Lahiroi. Sometimes it's a good thing to be able to sum up a life briefly and end up giving glory to God by it. Amen. Now I want to emphasize again that we're being exposed to God's work. This is all about God's work. This is not about history of people and so we become more acquainted with the people. We will become more acquainted with the people, but it's acquaintance with God that's a target behind it all. We're being introduced to how God works his purpose out. He doesn't just impose it on people and use them like puppets or chessboard members. So you're, we're seeing how God works. And that those in whom he works, there's a response, there's a response between him and them. There's a connection between the people and and God people in whom he's working in God, there's a connection, association between them. Now the significance of Abraham is traceable to God's call and his eternal purpose. We don't know anything about Abraham up to that point, which was 75 years of his life. It isn't nothing good happened or anything, there's nothing significant happened. See, significance got to be defined by God, not by, Amen. not by men. 
There's no distinction associated with Abraham while he was called Abram. When his name changed, when the work got under, really got underway. He was not noted for believing God before God called him. He was not noted for being righteous before God called him. The first thing we know about him being righteous is after he was called and after God made a promise and he believed in the Lord and was conned him for righteousness and up to that point there's no mention of any righteousness that Abraham had. His religious background was one of idolatry. Joshua mentioned it in Joshua 24.2. To Abraham's father and that family they, they worshipped idols. There's pretty strong evidence that after Abram was called, he did his work among his household, among his family, and they weren't idolaters anymore after that. There's no record that he or his relatives prayed to God or sought the Lord or were in any way consciously associated with God. No reference of this before he was called. So Abraham is a sterling example of this promise that was given concerning the Gentiles, but it's lived out right here in Abraham. I am sought of them that ask not for me. <laughs> I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me, unto a nation that was not called my by name. Well, that happened to, this exactly happened to Abraham. He wasn't, so far as we know, seeking the Lord. If he was, it was, was just not credited to him. And God's call of him wasn't a response to a plea by Abraham. So this text is lived out in Abraham. And if you have discernment, it was lived out in you too. Yeah. Lived out in you too. Even though God had placed all nations both in time and in location with, with an objective in mind that they should seek the Lord if happily, we would say perchance, they might feel after him like groping in the dark and find him. That's their vocation. That's the occupation of humanity. That's the appointed occupation of humanity. Whoever's not doing it, which is like everybody by nature, is disobedient. Remember, Paul said to Titus, we ourselves sometimes were disobedient. So people read that and they think it was just the law. Well, yeah, it was disobedient there too, but it was disobedient and not seeking the Lord. Not pursuing him until you found him. There's no evidence that uh, Abraham did this either. I suppose it could be conjectured that he had, but it's, it's just not stated that way in Scripture. If he had sought the Lord, then God would have responded like he did to Cornelius. It was a little bit different than Abraham. Cornelius was a different than Abraham. Abraham had been exposed to the truth like Cornelius had. He'd been exposed to what the Jews had. All of this highlights the work of God, that in the work of God, a legitimate now, a legitimate work of God, is initiated by God. Yeah. Amen. Not by man. I know it's fashionable, particularly in the contemporary church, to start something and then ask God to carry it on. But this really isn't the way the kingdom of God works. This isn't the way God works. God isn't there to help you out with your project. You're here to assist him as he, when he calls you into the work. He is demonstrated in Abraham. And in how God talked about, God would talk about his connection with Abraham and how the whole thing got started. For instance, Genesis 15, 7, God said, I'm the Lord that brought thee out of Ur of the Chaldees. He someone said, well, Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees. He went out, well, and he did. But that was, that was 
second layer. The foundation was I brought you out. Joshua said to the people of Israel, speaking for God, I took your father Abraham from the other side of the flood. The flood, there's the Nile River. And led him throughout the land of Canaan and multiplied his seed and gave him Isaac. I did that, God said. Joshua told him, God did that. God took him out. God brought him in. God gave him Isaac. Stephen, he referred to this too. The God of glory appeared under our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he dwelt in Karen and said to him, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and come into the land which I will show thee. And he, he gave him a covenant of circumcision. That's just something God. God did that. The prophet Isaiah is called another witness of the stand. This is how you talk about your conversion. This is how you talk about it. This is how you testify about it. Amen. When you're testifying to somebody how you become a Christian, don't tell them what you did. Tell them what God did. Amen. Amen. Here's the prophet Isaiah. He said, he redeemed Abraham. It's Isaiah 29, 22. Again he said, look unto Abraham your father and unto Sarah that bear you, for I called him alone. He's the only one in his family I called. And I blessed him and I increased him. That's how you talk. That's how you talk about a work God's done. Now I don't know of any personal evangelism course or testimonial class where they teach people to do this. Maybe there is one. Maybe there is one. You ought to get out in the forefront if it is. This is not normally what people are told to say. It's clear that Abraham is preeminently a person God called. That's how, he was a man of faith, he was that too, but preeminently, over, over and above that, he was a person God called. So he's a significant introduction to the way God works and the kind of people he recognizes. Okay, we're being, our minds are being trained. All of Scripture approaches the records of key people and events from this vantage point. You see, if you're familiar with Scripture, you know this. If you don't, as you become familiar, this begins to stand out to you. God talks about someone, he'll make a point that he, he's the one that did whatever was done in him. If it's Paul the Apostle, he chose me from my mother's womb. He'll tell you. All of this uh, postulates or is built on the premise that God is overall. Amen. Right. And that his purpose is the driving impetus behind human history. All that presumes that. If a person doesn't see that, they're not going to see anything. God will just build a fence right there. They will not be able to understand anything else God said or did. No. Got to first understand that. There is one who is able to save and to destroy. That's all there is. One. Nobody gets in if he doesn't call them. Nobody is cleansed if he doesn't wash them. Nobody is strengthened if he doesn't strengthen them. That's how you have to think about God. And it's all introduced here. All right, let's get into our text. Whenever, oh, yes. whenever this, whenever you see the Lord in this correct view, then it actually bolsters your salvation. Yes, amen. Your, your confidence is strengthened. <laughs> you have boldness to enter into the holiest place because of the blood of Christ. Amen. Mm -hmm. And and whenever, whenever the um, the sovereignty of God is not seen in this light, your confidence wanes. That's right. And, it, mm -hmm. and, and you don't. The foundation is shaky. Amen. Good point. Amen. Now we're going to take up again talking about Abraham. Then again, text says, then again. This is how God considers things. There's a lot happened since 
if the, if you had a spotlight that can see Abraham's life from the marriage of Isaac until this time, there are probably a lot of things happen. But when he says, then again, he said, this is the next significant thing as God sees things. This is the next thing we're going to record about Abraham's life. Even though God knows all the details, understand. God knows your thoughts and everything. He knows them all. When it comes to scripture, then again, This was not like the next day in Abraham's life. This was the next key event in Abraham's life. Now recently recorded events include Abraham tested by God to offer up Isaac as a burnt offering. That was an event, recordable event. The death and burial of Sarah was a recordable event. The dispatching of his chief servant to get a wife for Isaac. Now we're going to cover his death. Yeah, this probably this probably spanned several years. Now, if you can learn, and you do have to learn to do this, if you can learn to think about your life in this way, it will revolutionize how you live. Yeah, amen. If you think back when somebody bad-mouthed you back there, that's what you think about. Someone reject you or hurt you, that's what you think about. When it took a bad turn, you were fired unjustly, huh? that's what you think about. You are sticking daggers. You're not helping yourself at all. You need to learn to think in terms of these epochs. When all of a sudden your whole life changed, that's the way you think about life. Amen. Now it's not that God isn't in the details of life. He is. For instance, what it says, He careth for you. First Peter, that's a daily thing. But you've got to think of it that way. He careth for you. I understand that you can identify particular points when He did that. And we don't discourage that. But the potency is not when He did it. It's that He did it. Yeah. That it's his nature to do it. He hears our prayers. 1 Peter 3.12 I'm showing that God is involved in the daily parts of life, but you don't think in bits and pieces about these things. He directs our way. Proverbs 21.39 Jesus intercedes for us all the time. Yeah. Spirit makes intercession for us all the time. God's all the time working things together for our good. Amen. We enjoy the communion of the Holy Spirit on a regular basis. Jesus teaches us on a regular basis. And it gets down to even provides food, clothing, and shelter. Because yeah. he knows you have need of these things. But when you think of your life, you can't get down here on the lower level. Because you're going to have to interpret too much. You're going to see things where, well, I wonder whether God was in that or not. You've got to think, you've got to think of the clear things, that got points that got, are identified in Scripture. When your eyes were enlightened, all right, that's a point. That's a point to reason from. Amen. When the day dawned, that's a point. When your sins were washed away, that's a point Amen. to reason on. Amen. I'm not going to linger on this, but I want to just comment on the estimated age of Abraham during these relatively few events. Remember, we're talking about a man that lived 175 years. He was 75 when he left Haran. He was 85, we estimate, at the time Sarah gave Hagar to Abraham. He was 86 when Ishmael was born. He was 89 at the time Ishmael was circumcised. He was 99 when the time of Isaac's birth was announced. He was 100 when Isaac was born. He's 103 estimated when Isaac was weaned. When he's commanded to offer Isaac is somewhere between 121 and 130. 
At the time Sarah died, he was 137. When Isaac sent, when his servant was sent out to find Isaac a wife, he's about 140. He married Keturah, we don't know how old he was, and he died at 175. Now that's, that's not many points to, <laughs> to wrap up a person's life in. Unless you're talking about someone who's in the purpose of God. Now then that's a whole other matter. When God's the center of your thinking, you look at things differently. Yeah. You can hop over. You can hop over when you went down to Egypt. Yeah. The Lord was culturing his people to think like this in the Old Covenant whenever he would command them to raise up an altar at a certain yes. place whenever they passed through the Jordan. He said, take Good. those 12 Good. stones. And when your children ask you, mm -hmm. then you tell them this. It was meant for a reminder of what the Lord did for them. And I was the song, I can't remember the title of the song, but this, the line, it says, Here I raise mine Ebenezer, yeah. hither by thy help I'm come. That Ebenezer was something that the people right. of the Lord raised up as That's a remembrance right. of his work that day. Now, don't you think it's a good idea for us to exhort one another to raise some Ebenezers when significant points in your life happen in your identity with God to kind of have a way of marking that? So you can go back to a C. Abraham didn't have a memorial to when Pharaoh wanted Sarah to be his wife. Raise a pillar up to that. Huh? Or when he had to go out and rescue Lot. Or when he had trouble with Abimelech wanting his wife. Or when he encountered a famine in Canaan. He didn't raise memorials. And you shouldn't either. Amen. Now you'll wrestle with this. I know I'm, I'm a person of bike passions. You'll be tempted to think a lot about things that kind of put you in a hole in the ground. You think about it, boy, boy, oh, that was terrible. Stop thinking about it. Amen. Learn to scan your life and see the mountain peaks in it, not the valleys. Amen. Abraham took a wife. We don't know where she's from. We don't know her nationality. We just... In fact, some people have made it this statement. Keturah was lost by him in history. We don't know one thing. We don't know anything about her at all. The only reason she's even mentioned is because she's married to... Abraham married her. That's it. Now, see, this isn't the way God talked about Sarah. When it comes to Scripture, this isn't how he talked about Sarah. Because Sarah was in the heart of his purpose. Keturah was off on the side. She'd be used. We're not going to talk a lot about Keturah. Now, I mean, I don't know if you... This was Abraham's wife. This was, this was not like a neighbor. Uh, you got to learn to really learn to talk about the right people and make the right associations. A lot of people experience a tremendous amount of what the world calls distress or discouragement because of what they think about. They don't understand something. So instead of saying, I don't understand it, Lord, show me what it means, and if not, I'm moving on. Instead, they just keep on trying to figure it out. Yeah. Pretty soon they're down in the, as they say, down in the dumps. Now, so far as the record's concerned, Abraham was married to three people at different times, not no two at the same time. He was married to Sarah. Then when he was with Hagar, they, he took her to be a wife, not permanent and Keturah. All of them had children. Hagar had one. Keturah had six. Sarah had one. When God talks about it, he always mentions the one Sarah had. <laughs> now here's a story and statement about, from Moses about God's view of Israel. I'm showing now who God talks about. 
Some people would have you believe that God always is talking about the lost. He's always said, all the lost out there need me go out there to the lost, the lost this, the lost that. No, but see, this is not a proper representation of God. And people can say, well, are you saying? No, I'm just saying what I said. Don't try and hang on it some meaning I didn't put on there. Just take it for what it says. Here's a story in statement made, God made by Moses to Israel. Who would be parallel to talking to the church today. Thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God. He didn't say, oh, the Philistines need what you've got. The Midianites need what you've got. we got to get out there to those other nations, folk, and let them know what you've got. That's not what he said. If you're a holy people unto the Lord, the Lord thy God, the chosen need to be a special people. Us, a special people? Yeah. Some people don't think there's such a thing. God has chosen to be a special people, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. The Lord did not set his love upon you or choose you because you were more than a number than any other people. For you were the fewest of all people. But because the Lord loved you and because he would keep the oath which he sworn unto the father, your fathers, hath, God, hath the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you out of the house of bondmen in the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And again he said, Deuteronomy 14.2, Thou art a holy people unto the Lord thy God, and the Lord has chosen thee to be a peculiar people unto himself above all nations that are upon the face of the earth. This is how God wants his prophets to talk to his people. Here's Amos. Amos reasoned. You only have I known of all the families on the earth. Therefore I'll punish you for all your iniquities. Now, the church ought to be addressed in a similar fashion. And if you're familiar with the epistles, you'll find that's exactly, particularly Paul, that's exactly what he do. He'd address them as the saints of the Lord, the called of the Lord, the one who's been washed, the ones who's been sanctified. He always addressed them from that viewpoint. Why? Because we need to hear things like that. We got enough stuff in ourselves that it could make raise doubts about this. So this is how God talks now to his people and it's how he records the testimony about his people. Now the parallel as I've just mentioned is in redemption the same as it was with Israel, the same as it was with Abraham. He values some people above other people. No, I don't think God does that. Well, fr frankly, we don't care what you think. That's right. God has spoken on this issue. Amen. You haven't even got a right to talk about the subject. When God has spoken about a subject, nobody has a right to sound out an opinion on that matter. Amen. God has spoken. He values some people above all others. He's got some people that are in his hand. And he says, no man is able to pluck them out of my hand. Now, are you going to tell me everybody's in Christ's hand? That he was saying everybody's in there? He was talking about his sheep, which is the theme of John 10, where that, chapter, where that verse is found. So there are some people valued above others. Not because they merit it, any more than Abraham merited it or Israel merited it. But if you don't know this, if you, if you do not see yourself in this category, it will be easy for Satan to beat you down. Amen. You've got really, you've really got to see this. The church needs to be told this. Amen. Amen. I don't know how something as significant as this could have been swept under the old institutional rug, Amen. but it has been. Amen. Yes. Yeah, this uh, very thing came up with um, that hair lady, Rita, we've talked about. Mm. She, we were talking and she brought this up. But even though our sins have taken away, we're still sinners, right? So we reasoned on this for a few minutes and she, it came to her. She said, he told that lady to go and sin no more. Yes. <laughs> I said, yeah, I said, and she could do it. She said, I never thought of this before. Yeah. But see, she had been duped. 
And they're thinking yes. that even though she knows, she says, I know I'm saved, but I just, I can't help but sin, right? I said, no, you don't have to sin. And this was revolutionary to her. Amen. This, this idea that Christ took away my sin, Amen. so I don't have it anymore. Yes. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Now, you notice how God reasoned with Israel about it. He said, because I've chosen you above all other people, I'm going to be extra hard on your sin. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to overlook it. Amen. The church has not been told this. Yes. Yeah. Judgment begins at the house of God. Mm -hmm. It's not because this is just what God does. This is what God does when he washes the people and cleanses the people and sanctifies the people and writes their name in the Lamb's book of life they had better live accordingly if they don't the chastening hand of God's going to come down Amen. yes people who have been called by God don't live according to that then they've, they've rejected what Christ did in his offering and sacrifice to buy them that's right mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so the Lord takes that very seriously because we know that, that Christ was his beloved mm -hmm. and I might say that they probably don't realize what you just said, they don't think of it that way because their senses have been dulled. When it's possible for a person's religion to dull their spiritual senses. Right. Right. So that they don't, they forget this. Even though this is recorded and it's pretty plain and once you hear it, you, know, you can see it. But see when a person is dull of hearing, as the scripture says? Now you know why Satan's raised up what he's raised up. Babylon the Great, this is why. He knows if he can get people dull of hearing, he knows what they'll do. Yeah. Well, it seems to me that it's kind of an amazing thing when you think about the two things you just mentioned, this feel-good, sentimental message of everybody's important, everybody's included, mm -hmm. but at the same time, they preach a message of we're all failures. <laughs> yes. <laughs> And yeah, that's right. yes. so nobody's special. Mm -hmm. right. We're all spe we're, we're all lost. We're all sinners, and so forth. And and both of those tend to, uh, as you said, make yeah. people weak, but also tend to make the institution strong. Oh mm -hmm. yes, makes so it more the necessary. the institution gives us this message. Yeah, that's right. Good, and that's it also right. gives us a message to keep us in line mm -hmm. and make us submit to the institution right. and the leaders. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Brother Kevin. Yes. What uh, Brother Bob said about this woman that was duped. This is a problem we have today of uh, Satan getting people away from even reading the Bible. People don't even read the Bible anymore. Because I, I remember I was talking to you one time when I was going through Romans, I said, and I was looking at um, what Romans was talking about, I said, how can people talk the way they do? Christian? I'm talking about Christians. And then and not um, read Romans and come up with the, what the ideas they come up with. And you said, Brother Jeremy, they're not even reading their Bible. I mean, it's obvious they're not reading the yes. Bible, but this is important to know what God says. That's right. See, God's Scripture, what Scripture is, it's the mind of God encased in print. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. How He thinks and how He works. Well, let's get back to Keturah now. She, he, he took Keturah to wife, and she bare him. Zimran, Jokshan, Medan, and Midian, Ishbak, and Shua. Now to show you how unimportant those people are, some people, this may be the first time they heard those names. <laughs> these are not common names, the scripture people. Because these were a different kind of people. I give you a little cursory information about these six sons. Most of it's people guessing. They represent the, most of the Arab nations, the Arab world. That's who they represent. Now, at least 40 years before this, possibly a few more, Abram was described as his own body now dead. <laughs> it was impossible for him to have children. 40 plus years before this. So now at least 40 years later, his capacity to beget children continues. <laughs> Lo and behold, 
as a see that lifespan gradually reduced Adam 930 years I give you the ages of people up until the flood Shem lived 600 years the next, his offspring lived 438 big drop then Peleg he went 239 big drop again so rap rapidly the See, for hundreds of years, people were way up there, really, really lived a long time. Now, here's the point I'm going to make. That divinely given life does not easily pass away. That's the point that I'm going to make here. Life that comes from God doesn't just like abort suddenly. For several generations, 700 to 900 years, the people lived. Then gradually begin to diminished till finally leveled down to as Moses said three score and ten by reason of strength four score seventy to eighty years that's the now that's the average lifespan they say the average lifespan now in America about seventy two something like that this is between seventy and eighty that's the average some people live a lot longer like Methuselah lived nine hundred and sixty nine he's the only one that lived nine hundred and sixty nine but life decline slowly. Now spiritual life is the same way. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. It takes a long time yeah. for someone that God has quickened to die. Now the church, one of the churches there in Revelation, Jesus said, strengthen the things that are ready to die. Uh -huh. I've been along, apparently been a long while. It's an important point I'm going to make here. It takes a long time for what God's made alive to die. Judas, from, the, from day one, was a son of perdition, a child of hell, from the big, day one. But when he was in the presence of Jesus, he couldn't, yeah, he couldn't do what he normally would do. He said, Jesus really give him something legitimate. Yeah. Took a while for it to pass away. The best he could do is come pilfer, take some stuff out of the bag. But on the night Jesus was betrayed, <laughs> Satan took possession. Yeah. Right. But it's a lot of stuff led up. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Led up to that. When dealing with backsliders, this has got to be remembered. Their condition did not happen overnight. Amen. And if you approach it like suddenly they dropped off the edge, they didn't suddenly drop off the edge. Some of us had to deal with it, backsliders, some of my, myself included, on my own family. But after it occurred, then I could look back and I could see all kind of things I, did, I didn't. I didn't see as clearly. I didn't see it coming. See, that's the way. That's the way life is when person falls from the Lord. If you go in thinking that happened suddenly, they were caught unaware. See, you 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 you're making yourself liable. You're subjecting yourself to a dangerous situation. That's why those are spiritual. He says, you restore such a one that has fallen away. You that are spiritual, you restore them. Considering yourself now, lest you also be tempted. See, that's because this didn't happen suddenly. This is why some of us were able to recover. Huh? Yeah, amen. Some of us here, we know, we know each other. We, were, we had actually fallen away. But we were able to recover. Why? Because the remnants of that life didn't just... Yes, amen. Amen. <laughs> oh, this is a piece of good news. Let me tell you, if you know this, now you there's hope. Yes. Can have hope, can revive. You don't have to count people down. Mm -hmm. Maybe take a big jolt like Saul of Tarsus had a kind of a one of those heart jolts. That's right. But it got him alive. Yeah. Amen. yeah. Really? Yes. 
they have pertained to Judas, you know, when he was in the presence of, of Jesus in the original, it was very difficult for him. It made it, it, made it harder for him to That's sin. right. That's but right. It, this parallel is being in Christ. That's you know? right. And it's hard, by my own experiences, it's been really hard to convince a lot of, a lot of Christians that in Christ Jesus, you're not going to sin. When you're in Christ, you won't sin. First John declared. That's right. Mm -hmm. And the only way you can do it is to leave it. That's right. That's right. You got to leave the environment. Mm -hmm. Now this is another strong reason why you don't adapt your assembly to sinners. Amen. Right. Amen. Amen. You have a strong spiritual environment that at least is hard to sin when you're there. Amen. And if there is some little bit of life there, it could it could spark yes. spark true life. So here you have it in Abraham. While nature was declining, he was contrary to nature, maintaining. <laughs> Moses was the same way. At 120, his eyes hadn't grow dim and his strength hadn't abated. He was just as strong as when he was a young man. The day he died, the day the Lord took him, he, he was just as strong as he was when he was a young man. See, it was contradictory now to, to the most life. So Jesus, God can uh, abbreviate life or he can expand life. Yeah. I've experienced some of this myself that in older age when folk are saying, slow down now, slow down, Let's, don't be doing so much. So, I'm finding I'm learning more. Yeah. Slow down. <laughs> when the funnel's pouring out this good stuff, slow down? Sleep longer? See, I can't buy into that. Because the inner man, he's getting yeah. stronger every day. The outward man, he said, we know the outward man's perishing. How much, how well you know it after a while. But the inner man, he's not perishing. That's right. That's the nature of spiritual life. Well, it's a demonstrated there in Abraham's physical life. She had six sons. Then he mentioned some more offspring. Jokshan begat Sheba and Dedan. The sons of Dedan were Asherim and Latusim and Lumimim. And the sons of Midian, Ephah, and Ephah, and Hanak, and Abida, and Elda, all these were the children of Keturah. That's about all we know about them. That's, that's it. Now God had promised Abraham. He said, My covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. Yes. I'm going to get too far from the subject of someone telling someone who was collecting for the Lord to just slow down. I thought about the Israelites when they are picking up manna. If someone would tell them to slow down, mm -hmm. they would be like, yeah, right. You've only got till sunrise. You need to hurry up. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. Amen. <laughs> Amen. So I'm going to make of you many nations. Now Israel was only one nation. Right? Israel wasn't many nations. Israel was one nation. Make many nations. I'll be a father of many nations. For a father of many nations have I made thee. I'll make thee exceeding fruitful. To Rebecca and Isaac, we got two nations. The Israel's contained in the Edomites, yeah. Jacob and Esau. He said many nations. Now compared to Abraham's many nations, the only and only one of the nations Israel was meaningful. Where's the other nations going to come from? Now enters Keturah. <laughs> God promised Jacob, I'll make thy seed to multiply the stars. As the stars of heaven, I will give unto thy seed all these countries, and in thy seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. That seed was a single <laughs> nation. Later the Lord spoke to Jacob, saying, And thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west, the east, to the north, to the south, and in thee, and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. So here, Israel didn't spread out that way until they were scattered. 
The Lord also promised seed to Hagar. You remember that? The angel of the Lord said to her, I will multiply thy seed exceedingly, and it shall be cumbered for multitude. Twelve princes would be begotten by Ishmael. To this point, many nations are promised to come from Abraham's seed. And in addition to this, Ishmael, his seed would be multiplied greatly. There will also be nations come from the children of Keturah and from her grandchildren and her great-grandchildren, some of which were mentioned in that text. I give you some little bit of history about the nations that came from them. Most of them were the Arab nations, but God was populating the whole earth with his objective in mind that the knowledge of the Lord would cover the earth as the waters cover the sea. Yeah, so God's populating the earth with all that in mind. Yeah. He's raised up Israel, that's to bring the Messiah into the world. But the Messiah is going to bless the whole world. Yeah. So he's creating the whole world. Yeah, that's right. Here. <laughs> Brother Gibbon, I'm looking at this chart you have here on page six. I noticed if you go ahead to the, the account of Joseph, his 11 brothers, there are the, there are the Gibeonites. Here you have the Midianites and the Ishmaelites. But it wasn't the Isaacites. It was the Israelites. <laughs> Israelites that's right. Or not Israelites. Israelites. It's that, that's a Jacob's sons were the yeah. twelve tribes. Yeah, that's of it's getting getting even more detailed leading yeah, up to the right. coming of Messiah. And we can also see the peculiar people, yeah. even in the name. Mm -hmm. And the twelve tribes weren't twelve nations. That's right. They were a part of one nation, but he promised many nations, many nations. Now, uh, Paul in Athens, he told him a little bit about God here. He said, God has made of one blood, that's Adam, all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the whole earth, and he hath determined the times before bound, appointed and the bounds of their habitation as when they, when they came into existence and where they were to live, that they should seek the Lord if happily they might find him, Right, that, so that ties in with this many nations, see? So God has in mind a multiplicity of nations that represent diverse cultures and even forms of idolatry and all kind of people that were not God's people. But he has said to both Isaiah and Habakkuk that the time was going to come when the knowledge of the Lord would cover the cover the earth, where all these different nations were. Here's what he said. They shall not hurt nor destroy in my holy mountain. That's, that's Israel. For the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. That's Isaiah 11, 9. And Habakkuk said, 2, 14. For the earth shall be filled with the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea. Are you were witnessing the beginning of God working that out so the whole earth is going to be populated. Yeah. Now, let's add to this a little bit. <clears throat> Key nations would be joined together. Here's Isaiah 11:16. There shall be a highway for the remnant of his people which shall be left from Assyria like as it was to Israel in the day when it came when he came out of the land of Egypt. It's going to be a connection. In fact, he goes this far, the Gentiles would inquire of the Jews. I'm showing how God's purpose was bigger than Israel. And the Gentiles to come to thy light, which they haven't yet. Does anyone think they have yet? They didn't come. Maybe he lifted up his hand and those that didn't seek him. That's how we got in. Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come, these nations come to thee, Israel. Thy sons shall come from far, thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. Then thou shalt see and flow together, and thy heart shall fear and be enlarged, because the abundance of the sea shall be converted unto thee. 
and the forces of the Gentiles shall come unto thee. But the mouth of the Lord said this now. And this, ha this hasn't happened yet. Zechariah prophesied. Thus saith the Lord of hosts, In those days it shall come to pass that ten men shall take hold of all languages of the nations, even shall take hold of the skirt of him that is a Jew, saying, We will go with you, for we have heard that God's with you. Or right, does anyone think that that's happened? This hasn't happened. Israel, you see, is going to be grafted in again. And Paul, after expounding on it, Romans 9, 10, and 11, he reasons this way. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, that is, when the few branches were cut off, some of the branches were cut off, salvation expanded out into the rest of the world and began to... Salvation came to people who never expected it. And the diminishing of them, they're not as important now as they were, be the riches of the Gentiles. I have all God's, a lot of God's people found in here. How much more their fullness? What if what <laughs> if they when they were reduced, this happened, what's gonna happen when they all come in? Oh, praise God. <laughs> For I speak to the Gentiles, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the Gentiles, I magnify my office. If by any means I may provoke to emulation them that are in my flesh, and might save some of them. For if the casting away of them, Israelites, be the reconciling of the world, Gentiles, what shall the receiving of them be but life from the dead? There is to be a massive resurrection. Yeah, that may not be as far away as some people think. See, we're witnessing a divine preparation for that because the latter harvest is going to be much bigger than the additional one was. Yeah. On the day of Pentecost, we got the Pentecost was the harvest of first fruits. So on the day of Pentecost, there was a first fruit harvest and the early rain of John the Baptist and Jesus' ministry. It was an early rain that preceded it, brought that initial harvest. First ripe fruits, but there's a ladder. Uh -huh. There's a ladder harvest and a ladder rain, and more's coming in at the end than come in at the beginning. Amen. And it was a big beginning, you know. We got we got to talk in terms of thousands when you talk about the beginning. So although all the, all the offspring of Hagar and Keturah were Gentiles, all of them were. And they were excluded from the promise of heirship. They couldn't replace Israel, and they couldn't be combined with Israel but they can be joined to Christ with Israel. Amen. Anyway, it's a marvelous thing to think about, isn't it? <laughs> oh, well, praise God. Now Abraham, still alive, he gave all that he had to Isaac. And he was rich. Remember, Abraham was rich. Like if I gave all I had to my one of my sons, I mean it wouldn't. Well, he'd still have to work. <laughs> yeah, it wouldn't be sufficient. But Abram was rich. Gave all that he had. See, God said, "I'll bless thee and make thy name great." I'll do it. He did. He did. He blessed him and made his name great. After God had tested him by commanding him to offer Isaac, he said, "I will bless thee." That was after that test. I was all over and the ram had been offered up in the stead of Isaac. He said, I'll bless thee. And he did. He did bless him. That blessing was exceeding large in scope. It included his, his name being great. So when you heard Abraham, well, almost any place in the world, people know about Abraham. See, one, uh, one third of the world is, is uh, to one third, yeah, one third of the world is Christian. They know about Abraham. Then you got a billion and a half are Muslim. So now you're about three fourths. They know about Abraham. 
I'll make thy name great. Why do they know about Abraham? I will make thy name great. I'll bless them that bless you and I'll curse them that curse you. I'll multiply your seed. I'm showing how he bless Abraham. I'll multiply your seed. I'll make nations come to you. And you'll possess the land of Canaan. And the whole world's going to be blessed through your seed. That's how he blessed. That's, a, that's big. That's big. Because of the nature of the blessing, Abraham became a wealthy man. Why? Because God blessed him. That's why he became wealthy. Does it mean everyone is wealthy, is blessed by God? Well, in a sense, I understand you can't, God gives that to everybody, but it, not in the sense of Abraham. Not a special covenantal blessing. The key nation would come from him. And even though it happened, it hadn't happened yet. Is the nation Israel hadn't been born yet, and the land wasn't Abraham's yet. He gave everything he had to Isaac. Now that did include real estate, you know, and all this sort of thing. But he also became an heir of the promise. Amen. Ah, the promise was passed on to Isaac. I'm going to give this land to you. It was given, the promise was bequeathed to Isaac. Now Abraham's riches had spanned over quite a number of years. He wasn't noted for being rich before God called him, but when he was in Haran, he obtained substance and souls, the Bible says, when he was in Haran. Stopped there when he was 75, and he went from there to Canaan. When Abraham went up to Egypt, he was very rich in cattle, silver, and gold. Went up out of Egypt, he's very rich in cattle, silver, and gold. Because Pharaoh gave him sheep and oxen and he asses and men servants and maid servants and she asses and camels. So his wealth increased. After the episode with Abimelech, king of Gerar, Abimelech was given sheep and oxen, men servants, and women servants. So one time would come the <coughs> his servant is seeking a wife for Rebekah. He said to the household of Rebekah, The Lord has blessed my servant greatly, and he's become great, and he has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and men servants, maid servants, camels and ants. He didn't say, and Pharaoh gave him men servants, and Abimelech gave him men servants and maid servants. And he says, The Lord gave it to him. Amen. Now, this is how. You are authorized to think. So let's say that you've uh, you need resources, but you, you don't have very many, very many of them. You're wondering how you're going to get along. You're doing the best you can. God can increase your resources. Amen. So you got to think. He knows you have need of these things. Come on, now seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness and all these things will be added. Amen. They will, amen. Well, some of us have experienced this. You can, everybody can experience this. It's in Christ. Looking at the uh, uh, increase of Abraham, here's what Isaiah said. Look unto Abraham your father and unto Sarah who bare you, for I called him alone and blessed him and increased him. Think about that, God said to Israel. So Abraham's wealth wasn't traced back like to his business acumen. He was a sharp financier. Had the ability to amass a fortune. He gave all he had to Isaac. Which means he knew more than just here. He knew Isaac was the heir. Yeah, that's right. He had some other children, Ishmael and these other six through Keturah, but he knew Isaac was the heir. Yeah. And he wasn't going to divide the inheritance among the other sons. Now there's no record that Hagar said, this is just not fair. Man, Ishmael lived here for 13 years. Come on now. He has at least some Keturah. There's no sign. She said, wait a minute now. I bore you these six sons. 
They ought to have an equal share in the inheritance. Huh? See, God shut those mouths. That's right. There's some people don't have a right to what God gives. There are. They don't have a right. Yes, amen. Amen. The other people do have a right, but they need to be told. Abraham knew Isaac was the, was the heir. He didn't split it up among the other children. God made clear to Abraham, this is your heir. Now Abraham shapes his life around the revealed status of Isaac. He's come to the end of his life now. He's going to de depart. He's thinking about what God said. He's not thinking about what, how close he was to the boys. They must have been like close to men when they left. He's not thinking about well, they sure were nice sons. They worked hard. He gave them some gifts. Not the inheritance. He shapes his life around what God said. This is an excellent example of doing the will of God. It's an excellent example of how you do the will of God. You shape your life around what God's promised and what God said. Let the chips fall where they may. Yeah. So to speak. Now here's the type. Jesus Christ is the appointed, quote, heir of all things. God's given it all to his son. Jesus said, the Father's given all things into my hands. That's where it is. Again, he said, all things are delivered to me and my Father. So his Father gave him everything. Now at this point, the reality soars beyond the shadow. Ah, the antitype goes far beyond the type. Isaac didn't divide the inheritance, ah, but Jesus does. Yes, amen. After God had received, Jesus was satisfied with the sacrifice. Isaiah 53, 11 and 12, he said, And he shall divide the spoil yes, amen. with the strong. So here's what Jesus does. Jesus divides the share with the other sons, yes. which Isaac didn't. He wasn't required to do. So you see, it's a type. Everything's in Christ's hands, and if you're in Christ, you get access to it all. I say access to it all. You don't get it in the same measure Jesus got it. You don't, like, you don't build new barns to hold all this stuff. Right. You get it when you need it, and when you perceive it enough to ask for it. Marvelous to see. Now you can say, truthfully, all things are yours. Amen. Life, death, things present, things to come all yours. Why? Because it was all given to Christ and this is how Christ feels about those that are joined to him. He shares the inheritance. In fact, we're called joint heirs. Now we have an in intensely interesting phrase here, the sons of the concubines. And this has stirred up a lot of uh, discussion among people. Who were the concubines? Some say, well, it was Hagar and it was Keturah. But see, he said, there's a sense in which this is true, but there's, I'll just say it this way. I don't know anything more about it than what it says here. <laughs> this is so I don't, I don't speculate about who were the concubines. I just, I don't know. I don't know what, I don't know if that's intended to mean Hagar and Ishmael. Hagar and and the sons of Keturah. I suppose it could be, except he didn't give gifts to Ishmael. That's the flying ointment. When he sent Ishmael away, he sent the sons away, he's going to give them gifts. But he didn't give gifts, he just gave a bottle of water and a piece of bread. Yeah. That's all he gave them. That's all he gave Hagar and her boy. That's all he gave them. A bottle of water and some bread. So why did he do it? Because God had said to Abraham, I will bless, I will bless Ishmael for your sake. Yes. An angel told Hagar, I'm going to make a great nation of him, he'll have 12 princesses, I'll make it, I'll bless him. So his blessing didn't depend on what Abraham would give him. God gave Ishmael what he had. But for the sons of the Keturah, evidently they were only going to get some token gifts that he'd give them. Gave them gifts. Gifts, that's not like estate, real estate. 
It's not the promise to be like a gold and silver and things like this. It was enough evidently for them to get their nation started. So it wasn't like a gold gold earring and a couple of bracelets. I mean it was but it was gifts. It was things that uh, weren't really included in Christ, in Abram's inheritance. <clears throat> He sent them away. Where did he, he gave them gifts. He sent them away from Isaac. <laughs> from Isaac. He didn't send them away from Abraham. Didn't send them away from Keturah. He sent them away from Isaac. It's the same thing that happened to Ishmael. Remember, he was that same thing that happened. He's, he said he was cast out. At some point, those who are heirs and those who are not are going to have to separate. And blessed is the person who knows when. <laughs> this didn't take place right up when they were babies. But at some point that has to happen. Ultimately the complete separation will be when Jesus comes. He's going to make the final wheat from the tares and sheep from the goats. Separation is going to be made. However, as it was with Keturah and her sons, there do come times when people that are have been kind of close together have to part ways. It not be un unequally yoked together. Yeah. For an heir to be living in the same house with children who are not heirs, that's an unequal yoke. Now you you got to work this out yourself. I mean, we're not going to hold any classes like on how you do this. But it does have to be done. Yes, you have to find it. You have to know. You have to know when to do this. You're close to the Lord. You'll, he'll, he'll, he'll direct you in this. You'll know when it's cut, he's got to cut the line. That's it. No more. Send him to a far country. No sign he ever came back to visit. Anything like that. In the parable of the wheat and the tares, it was when they began to bear fruit. That's right. Amen. Yes. Amen. You have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness. It's just. You won't have fellowship with the. Un mm -hmm. Yeah, Ishmael was out so late and sooner he started causing trouble. That's yeah. right. Amen. And Babylon, he says, come out, from, come, come out of her, my people. That's not the territory of blessing. Yeah, that's, right. that's not where I'm living. Yeah. That's not where my spirit is working. These aren't the people my son's interceding for. Get out of there. Amen. That's what he says. My people. And he sent them into the east country. It's generally conceded that this was Arabia which is to the southeast of Israel. I don't have to say this here, but if you go forward, you can connect that Jacob was watching some of this. He was a boy. He was a teenager yeah, yeah. while some of this was happening. Yeah. He was born when Abraham was about 160 years old. He was born when Isaac was 60 years old. So Jacob was 15 he years could, old when Abraham died. Yeah, he could have very, yes, you're right. Very well been. Part of it. He knew some of what was happening. That's right. Mm -hmm. and his, no doubt his mother explained him to it on the mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he did this while he yet lived. <laughs> he didn't leave this to just, oh, the boys will work it all out. Yeah. While he yet lived. Well, that's the way Jesus was with us. While he yet lived among men. After he rose from the dead. While he yet lived. He spoke about. The promise of the Father and so forth. Now these are the days of Abraham. The days of the years of Abraham's life. Which he lived a hundred, three score and fifteen years. In, uh, 
the, the episodes that cover that would not make a very thick book. <laughs> a biography of Abraham's life would be a very, very skinny book. Then it simply says, Abraham was gathered to his people. Now I want to spend a little time here. First he gave up the ghost. He gave up the ghost. Now men have had trouble with this expression. What, what does it mean? So here's what some of the versions say. New King James says he breathed his last. Basic Bible English says he came to his death. The Jew say, whole book Jewish Bible says he took his last breath. Darby's version says he expired. Geneva Bible he yielded up his spirit. Hmm. Jewish Apostolic Bible says he came to failing. Douay version says he decaying. English Revised version says he grew weak. International Standard Version says he passed away. Amplified Bible says Abraham's spirit was released. And the Interlinear Bible says he is expiring and he is dying. In other words, it's hard to explain here what happened. But the scriptural words are defined doctrinally, not Amen. lexically or le academically. That's how we're going to look at it. In the matter of death, the composition of man must be known so you can understand what happens when a person dies. In creation, God formed a body, then he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Not a living body, not a living body, a living soul that was in the body. So it's a seen part and unseen part. The essential person is unseen and dwells in what Job called houses of clay. Mm -hmm. So there's a seen part and unseen part to, ma to mankind. Mm -hmm. Job says there's a spirit in man. There is, there is, there's a spirit in man. And it's not just breath. Because we know that even Solomon knew the spirit of man is enlightened by God. The seen part, body, is dependent on the unseen part. So if the unseen part lives, that's it for the body. Because the body without the spirit is dead being alone. See, so your spirit doesn't depend on your body. Your body depends on your spirit. Now in Christ we have a superior revelation about this matter that they didn't have. We learn in Christ that man is what's called a tripartite being. He's a three-part being. There's an unseen part, but the unseen part consists of two unseen parts. Yeah. One's called a spirit, one's called a soul. The spirit, as we understand it, is the essential person. The soul is the rational and expressive powers, the, the thing that makes the body work. Those three parts. And in Scripture, they are all to be sanctified. Spirit, in order of their priority. First Thessalonians 5.23, in order of priority. Spirit, soul, and body. Three parts. Now the phrase, gave up the ghost, must be comprehended in that greater context. Not in light of what Moses said, in light of what came later. Now let's think of the error of people who define death by what people who lived under lesser light said. So they will, these are soul sleepers, or all these kind of people. So they will appeal to what was said about death by those who had less light. Here's some of the, here's some of the sayings. What sir, is Ecclesiastes 9.10. Whatsoever thy hand find to do, do it with thy might, for there is no work, nor device, nor knowledge, nor wisdom in the grave. Whither thou goest. Mm -hmm. Here's David. 
For in death there is no remembrance in thee, in the grave who can give thanks? All right, here's Psalm 88, 10. Will thou show wonders to the dead? Shall the dead rise and praise thee? See, law, think on this. Shall thy love and kindness be declared in the grave, or thy faithfulness in destruction? Shall thy wonders be known in the dark, or thy righteousness in the land of forgetfulness? That's what they said about death. Psalm 38. Isaiah 38, the grave cannot praise thee, death cannot celebrate thee, they that go down into the pit cannot hope for thy truth, the living, the living, he shall praise thee, as I do this day, the father of the children shall make known thy truth. When it comes to the things of God, you had better have more to say than what Moses and the prophets said. You're going to have to elaborate on a number of things. These are all valid statements from the standpoint of appearance. That's, it's not that they're not true. It's from the standpoint of appearance. This is true. See, death is a separation of the seen from the unseen. Now, even this was, hit, even this was declared in the old scriptures. Here's a description of Rachel dying before the law was given or anything written in scripture, it came to pass as her soul was in departing. Yeah. For, then he explains, for she died. That's what happened when you die, your soul yeah. give up the ghost. Yeah. Well, about the resurrection of a child by Elijah. The Lord heard the voice of this Elijah and the soul of the child came into him again. How about Jairus' daughter? Her spirit came again. So the phrase gave up the ghost can be seen in the greater light, the light of greater revelation. It's when the unseen part left the body. And some versions read this way. The Geneva Bible says he, he yielded up the spirit. The Amplified Bible says Abraham's spirit was released. See, so, it, so some of the versions saw this, know this. Now I understand what this, this to mean this, that Abraham sensed the time of death was coming. So he resigned himself to it and willingly released his, didn't fight against dying in other words. He just submitted to the process. He knew the hour had come. And he gave up willingly the ghost, to the spirit. Ghost, ghost used to mean spirit of a person. Yeah, that's right. Well, that's what it meant. It didn't mean someone from the grave. Well, from the graveyard, that's what they associated with it, the spirit of the person. So, ghost, even of old time, meant a spirit of a person. That's right. We do understand from the account given by Jesus Himself that more than a millennium after his death, Abraham was still alive. Not in the body. But he knew about things, Jesus said. He knew about Abraham. He knew about Moses and he knew about the prophets. And both of those were hundreds of years after Abraham died. He said they have Moses. Remember the rich man said, send him back You'll believe someone come from the dead, come back from the dead. He said, no, if they don't, they have Moses and the prophets. They were a minimum of 500 years, some of them a thousand years, after Abraham had died. But Abraham knew about him. How did he know about him? He picked up on that after he died. And he died in a good old age. Well, that's what God said was going to happen. You remember when he appeared to him? Genesis 15, 15. He said, Thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace. Thou shalt be buried in a good old age. That's exactly what happened. That doesn't mean, it doesn't only mean a life of remarkable length. It means a remarkable life with remarkable benefits. Good old age. He was gathered, gathered to his people. 
Now, some people say that's the grave, but I'm, I'm sorry, I can't think of the grave as a gathering point, even though, <laughs> even though some of the patriarchs did talk this way. Jacob said this when he heard Joseph, he, his brothers lied about him and told him he'd been killed, you remember, and he said, I will go down into the grave unto my son. What is it? Genesis 37, 35. But the, the grave is not the gathering point, particularly for thy people, that's for everybody. Everybody goes down into the grave. But I'd rather use this, uh, think of this expression, he gathered to his people in view of Jesus bringing life and immortality to light through the gospel. <laughs> so let's think of some people that were gathered to their own people when they died. We call Lazarus to the witness stand. He was found with his own people in Abraham's bosom. <laughs> Let's think of the souls who were beheaded. They weren't all one place on earth. John saw them under the altar, the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God. They were gathered together under the throne. <laughs> gathered <laughs> under their people. We've been, we've been gathered together with some people that have left the earth. We've been called into the assembly of the spirits of just men made perfect. Huh? Here we are. Now we know this is the case that these people on the other side are alive because Jesus said, now God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God is not the God of the dead. Amen. But the God of the living, which means Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are alive. Yes. They were gathered to their people. Actually, all people be gathered to their people. He's not the God of the dead. I think it's a note in the life that you just said about our Savior's sayings there, the things that he revealed about the other side. Yeah. He did also say, one greater than Solomon is here. Amen. Solomon said a lot of statements, Amen. made a lot of statements about death. Yeah. But he didn't see very far. Yeah. That's right. He didn't see very far. He made a lot of statements about a lot of things, but he didn't see very far. One greater than Solomon is here. Yeah. yeah. I had someone ask me about that. As far as the earth being destroyed. Yeah. And so they pointed out, well, Solomon says the earth will remain forever. Well, Solomon didn't know it all, did he? That's right. And Jesus does. That's Amen. right. Amen. Yeah, no doubt from Solomon's viewpoint, he, what we would say, he couldn't see the end of it. Yeah. <laughs> but, Je but Jesus did see the end of it, yeah. see? Yeah. <laughs> now there's some others that are said to have been gathered to the people in the scripture. Now Ishmael was gathered to his people. These are the years of the life of Ishmael, 137 years. He gave up the ghost and died and was gathered to his people. <laughs> about that? Isaac, Isaac, Isaac gave up the ghost and died, was gathered unto his people. Jacob, when he made an end of commanding his sons, he gathered up his feet into his bed and yielded up the ghost and was gathered unto his people. Aaron, God said, Moses, Aaron shall be gathered to his people. Moses. He died and God brought his death. He told him, you will die on the mount whether thou goest up and be gathered to thy people. There was a generation of Joshua's time, generation of believers. It says, and also all that generation were gathered unto their fathers. There's the king of Judah. God said to him, behold, I will gather thee to their fathers. And brethren, there's a very real sense in which we are making associations now that will be culminated when we die. Yeah. Yeah. Be gathered to our own kind. Yeah. Now there's, uh, there's evidence in scripture that the judgment is not only going to be of individuals, it's going to be of nations. Jesus said the nations will be gathered before him, he'll separate them as a shepherd separates his sheep from his goats. There'll be cities. City of Nineveh rise up with Jerusalem. Yeah. So there'll be judgment by cities. Now this is just an opinion. 
But it seems to me that when we die, we'll be gathered together with the people that we'll be associated with at the day of judgment. Be gathered together with them. In our case, it would be the household of faith and it may be particular generations. Jesus spoke of a generation. There, Solomon said, there's a generation that fears God. David said, generation that fears God. And there was a generation that didn't. So the people that didn't fear God will be gathered to their to their people. People fear God be gathered to their people. That's a great blessing. Gathered to those of life, Amen. precious faith. Amen. Amen. In other words, our intimate associations aren't going to end here. Amen. Now when we part, it's hopefully by death it's accompanied by tears. And, but it's going to be accompanied with, it's not going to be accompanied with tears when we gather to our people. Amen. Amen. And Abraham was buried. He was buried and Ishmael and Isaac. Isaac and Ishmael buried him. Now when um, Isaac died, Esau, as mentioned first, Esau and Jacob buried him. But here, Isaac and Ishmael. It's just uh, interesting. I don't know what all you want to make out of that, but it's interesting. Ishmael apparently didn't did stay in contact. God he said God blessed him and apparently he stayed in contact because he, he knew about this. Yeah. Remember God said, I've heard the voice of the lad. I've heard him. I'm going to bless him. I'll multiply him. But he's not going to be an heir. Yeah. Now in scripture the common way of handling the dead is burial. No, there are no accounts of deliberate cremation. Yeah, that's right. Someone says, well, the bodies of Saul and Jonathan were burned. Yeah, but their bones were buried. Yeah. Come on. Come on. I read from a purported scholar just recently, a living one, that said we have an example of cremation in Saul and Jonathan. Do we? says they buried their bones. Right. Nobody buries the bones of who's been cremated. Right. Yeah. This is a hot topic today, I understand, but it doesn't make a difference, so we're going to talk about it. Amen. He's buried. Part of the gospel is Jesus was buried. Yeah, amen. Yeah. Moses was buried. Yeah. Stephen was buried. John the Baptist was buried. There's just too much about this in the Bible. I included an article on cremation at the end of this because uh, if you have to face the death of somebody, you have charge of what happens. The funeral director is going to make an effort to talk you into cremation. It's about half the price. You cremated for about 3,800 and it's up to 8,000 if you're burial. To try and talk you into that. But cremation was originated by heathendom and it does not take the resurrection into account. See, the body is the Lord's. That's a direct statement. 1 Corinthians 6, the body is the Lord's. You do not have a right to do with the body things that just you want to do, whether it's someone's body that's the spirit in it or it's not. It's not yours to do with. God's going to raise that by Well, God can raise it up on that. I know that. But resurrection, the hope of the resurrection is thought about when you bury your soul. You sow the body. That's what the 1 Corinthians says. So anyway, he was buried. He was buried in the cave of Machpelah. That's the same place where his wife was buried. You remember? That's the pl plot of land he bought. Yeah. It had this cave in it. Didn't God bury him? God buried Moses. Yeah, they tried to find him too. Didn't, didn't the devil dispute with? Oh yeah, about the body of Moses. About the, not about the ashes. Of no, about the Moses. Yeah, yeah, he buried Moses and didn't let anybody know where it was because you know what they'd done. They'd have built a temple around it. Oh, yeah. 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 Cave of Machpelah. And actually, his wife was buried there. Isaac was buried there. 
Rebecca was buried there. Jacob was buried there. But Rachel, she wasn't, because she died when they were in traveling. They were traveling, and she's buried in Bethlehem. But you have all the three of the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And with the exception of Rachel, their wives are buried there too. So this was, uh, and to this day, it's a revered place to this day. Yeah, yeah. 2012. Cave of Machpelah, they built a big structure around it, but it's a revered place mm -hmm. to this day. Another thing to note, they were buried, he was buried in Canaan. <laughs> they didn't send him back to Mesopotamia. Yeah. Yeah. He is buried in Canaan. Isaac is buried in Canaan. Jacob was buried in Canaan. But none of them owned any property. Yeah. The only thing Abraham had was a funeral plot. Yeah. So they buried in Canaan that was promised to them even though they didn't have it yet. All right. That's the same thing. We're in the same situation, brethren. Yeah. The meek shall inherit the earth. That's the promise we got. Amen. So we're buried here in the in it while we're here. We don't own it yet. But we're buried. See, it's all pictured right there. We're strangers and pilgrims in the in the world. First Peter two eleven. But it's not always going to be that way. You're going to give the whole thing to us one of these days. Abraham knew this too. He looked for a city had that had foundations whose builder and maker was God. That's what he looked for. The fathers of the ancient fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, it said of them that they saw a better country. They're looking for a better country. That is a heavenly. Now we're in the same same boat. Now, a quick uh, in closing here. It came to pass after, I say, it came to pass after the death of Abraham that God blessed his son Isaac. A I say he did it after. Amen. Now, I understand God blessed Ishmael, but not like he did Isaac. Not the same way. Isaac's blessing included his dwelling safely, safely in the land, his possessions, his posterity, being protected by the Almighty. Ishmael was a nomad. See? Isaac was a pilgrim. A nomad didn't have any place to settle down. A pilgrim, he was journeying through. He knew he, was, he had a place to go. Ishmael didn't have any, any place to go. Isaac he was going a certain place, it just wasn't here. That's all. Now here's the here's the parallel. It wasn't until after Jesus died that the blessing that God promised was bestowed. After Abraham died, then God blessed Isaac. After Jesus died, then, <laughs> then the people of God are blessed. Or to put it better, more succinctly, after the people know he died and why he died, then the blessing comes. Amen. And Isaac dwelt by the well Laheroi. That's the well at uh, Hagar. Remember, she was at that well when the angel Lord found her, and she gave God a name. Laherhoi was the name, the God that seeth. And Isaac lived there by that well. There's another parallel here to see. Now, if you want God to bless you, if this is what you want, you got to live by the well. Amen. A lot of people have spiritually impoverished lives because they're too far from the well. They're living too far from the well. He lived by the well. The well where God sees. And so I would uh, 
tenderly but firmly admonish you to live close to the wells of salvation. Amen. Be within within immediate reach of the wells of salvation. Never get out there so far away that you can't get to the well. Mm -hmm. A little something to see there. And I just saw a lot of things in this uh, passage that were very, they're like tender things. All lived out. God introducing us to himself, how he plans. He doesn't plan for small things. He plans for big things. We understand that it starts small, but that's not the, the objective isn't small. The objective is big and large. And where you're going is not small. It's not limited. It's not restricted. Not where you're going. Yeah, amen. And when you're gathered to your people, they're all going to be of one mind. Which would be good. <laughs> be, be good. You'll be able to nestle in the bosom, be comforted. Okay. Well, any of you have a word you'd like to add? Yeah, Judah? Right there at the beginning, you said that um, significance is to be, fine, to be defined by God, not by man. Thought things that men rank as significant, God can rank as dirt. That's right. So the wisdom of man is foolishness. Foolishness, God. yeah. See, God's evaluation of things that are significant are on a much larger scale than what man can even see. Amen. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know, for us um, in our day, especially in our country, water is something that's so easy to come by. We don't think we don't think of it very much. So sometimes when we see passages like this about a well, we don't always understand the significance. Yeah, that's right. Wells were critical to sustain life. You're more important than gold. Yeah, yes. yeah. It, this this week I had a, a day where I had to be out in the shop for an extended period of time. And, you know, it was over 100 degrees, and, and we were working on a machine. And it was like you know three hours later, and I was absolutely parched. Hadn't taken a break, gone and get a drink, nothing. I, I just I could not wait to get in there just just to drink water. I, I wasn't thinking of food. I wasn't thinking. I was thinking of water. What is you know, right? I wanted water bad. And and, and, and and this that's where you see. It. Parallel in here. That's right. These people were, were camped by wells. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Remember when they, in their travels, Israel come across an oasis. They had twelve wells and seventy palm trees, and they didn't they didn't just ride past it. <laughs> they stayed there for a while. Yeah. Yes. Amen. That's right. Hey, with Jeremy. Yeah, at the beginning there, you, you were talking about how testimony and everything, it's always about what God's doing. And um, just now, I was just thinking about this whole this thing about burial and, and how you said, uh, you know, this body is not ours. Everything that we do, it all belongs to God, whether it be our body and everything. And I, I have um, talked to people that, they always, there's some people that always, what, what if this, or what if that? And always, but I've always thought of it that way. Is it doesn't matter. If I can't understand it, it's always God's right, and I'll figure it out later. But I don't always, I always think of this this way, that God's doing everything he does is perfect. It's always going to work out that way. And the things that you may not be sure of, well, you just give that to God, and he'll open it up to you eventually. But... Like this, uh, well, I've, I've talked to some people about this uh, cremation because it's cheaper and whatever, and it's okay. God can put our bodies together. No, we don't think that way. No, we don't. It's not ours to do it. We don't think that way. We we, we bury our bodies in anticipation of resurrection, mm -hmm. and this is the way we are because we're believers. We believe. <laughs> Amen. Bill Tony. Uh, now, cremation, this has always been associated with pagans. Yes, it is. Always. 
Matter of fact, we never thought about cremation. No, no. Mm -hmm. uh, pagans, heathens did this. That's the way it's always been. Now, this is another thing that uh, the church is picking up and, put, and adopting and authorizing and signing off on it and popularity. And, and, and uh, I see it coming in and everywhere you read now everybody's being cremated. It's just the way it is when these trendy things go in, instead That's of the right. church standing up against this thing. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, they're, they're just, you know, bringing it right on in. Yes. Uh, it's, you know, just, just signing a death warrant. You can see it get it sewing the body. That was we sow. Yeah. We expect it to come up, but with the cremation, they don't expect it. So the fact that God can assemble ashes, it, and some people have been cremated like, accidentally, we might say. Uh -huh. But assembling ashes is not the point. Is that we, we expect something to yes. come up. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Just, just like Joseph said, take my bones out of that's here with right. you. Some people can eat my wild animals too, or fish. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. So these are all exceptions. Yeah. yeah. I was going to change subjects here. I was Let's go ahead. Enjoying the, the point that you made about... Abraham separating the rest of the sons from Isaac. He made them go away. Yes, and sir. in this world, there's a lot of times where we have to separate ourselves. We are the ones that have to withdraw yeah. or leave or go to another place. Yeah. But there's coming a time when by right, we are going to obtain the inheritance. Mm -hmm. and we can stay there then and separate the rest. Amen. <laughs> They're the ones they have to leave. <laughs> That's right. Amen. Yeah, Sister Maddie. Was considering is that Abraham in his lifetime not only was able to witness God's intervening in Sarah's barrenness, but he was able to to witness God's intervening in Rebecca's also. As we know that Rebecca was barren, and consider how great a testimony Abraham would have had in encouraging Isaac yeah. to, not, to not be discouraged by this situation and to be able to tell him this is not a hard thing for God. Amen. Amen. I was thinking about this, that um, uh, Isaac didn't get the blessing until after Abraham <laughs> had departed. And, you know, uh, uh, Elijah, remember, Elisha didn't get it until yeah, after right. Elijah was taken away. And, that, and there's, there's, this, there's this truth to the kingdom that, that when, when a person passes on, they, somebody's going to stand up and take their place to some degree. It may be divided to 40 people, but, yeah. but, but this, you know, this should it, it give you some confidence in that you, if you live a godly life and you, have a, you, you leave a godly heritage, how many people have been blessed by the works of Brother Paul? Yeah. How many millions of people yeah. have been benefited? And here Abraham dies and two, his sons buried him. Two sons come. Now all the nations of the earth were going to be blessed by him. Yeah. Many had already been blessed. And yet you see how, it, oh, this yes. is how the Lord whittled it down. These two, this is, this is because it was the chosen seed and a representative from the one that wasn't. That's right. They buried him. Amen. <laughs> All right, we'll have a word of prayer. <clears throat> Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for Abraham and for his record, and for the great testimony that it gives about the potency of faith and your own marvelous faithfulness. We pray that we may be able to appropriate, be appropriately called Abraham's seed. Bless us to this end in Jesus' name. Amen.